Good afternoon, everyone. Today I have for you a Panasonic mini boombox. Um, as you can see, I paid $7.99 for it. This is the model RX FS470. That's not quite entirely worn off here. It's got auto reverse, a cassette deck. This one's a bit beat up, quite dirty. Um, but the antenna's good. I am missing the battery cover, which is unfortunate, but since this will never be used on batteries, I'm just going to put 6D cells in it, really. Uh, it doesn't matter. What's interesting about this model is this model is from the CD era, so we've got a CD line-in jack on the top of it, in RCA for some reason. I have checked this out. I know that the radio works fine, the line-in jack works fine, and the cassette motor is spinning, so the uh, the capstans are the capstans are still working, but the the uh, hubs aren't. So uh, we have. Probably, if, assuming this is similar to other Panasonic's, um, Walkman type things and whatnot, then there's probably one of the two belts in it is bad. And I have my reach over collection of belts here, and there's some more, and we'll see if I'm lucky enough to have one that will work. I'm going to give this a very quick wipe down with some Windex and a microfiber cloth. I won't record that. This is going to need a serious clean once we get to it, but, uh, and it's got some paint on it, which is, seems to be characteristic of old boom boxes and radios in general, but that's what they tend to get used for later on. Um, I'm guessing as to the date of this one, I would say early 90s, based on the CD line in, it's black, it's got the relatively rounded shape that was characteristic of the 90s, it's certainly not 80s, I think. Uh, the question is how late in the 90s it is, but my guess is that something like this, Panasonic, to my memory, is not a company that changed model numbers all the time. It's not kind of like Sony where there'd be a whole bunch of different models. Uh, so my guess is this may have been on the catalog from like, we'll say 91 to 95. I wouldn't be surprised at all or slightly different versions of the same thing. Um, other things that show late 90s or, or, or early 90s, I mean, or even late 80s, or the fact that it claims to be a graphic equalizer over here, and it's got slider volumes and whatnot, which is, you know, very characteristic of that period. I will do a video where I compare, compare this one to a little 80s Sanyo that I've repaired earlier. I'll put a, well, that'll just show up as a new video at some point, just to show how the design cues changed so much between those periods. In any event, I'm hoping to find some date codes or something inside this, but I'm, I think I'm fairly safe to say this is the first half of the 80s um, little boom box. I think by the second half of the 80s, you would have not definitely not had RCA in jacks on it. Anyhow, uh, so let me clean this off a bit. We'll take a break and come back, and then we'll have a look inside and see if we can change those belts. All right, so here it is, a very quick clean. Didn't try to get into all the little spots, as you can see, but I tried to get the worst of it off. It's, you know, got a good dent here. There's some scratches in the trim, but not to worry. That's fine, given my suspected age of this. I haven't quite got that off. Assuming we get it all working, then I will give it a better clean. So let's have a look in the back and see what we've got in the way of screws. It looks like one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. Let's see what we can do. Let's push some other stuff out of the way a little bit here. Let's see what's going on. Spider webs coming out with the screws. 
Right, what have we missed? Ah, two screws hiding behind the antenna. We'll get those out and then we'll see how we're doing. Okay, one screw here. That's it. And there we go. So this one works backwards of a number of them that I've worked on in that the speakers come off the front. I'll wipe some of the dust out of the cassette mechanism now that we're here. Let's see what we can see. We'll collect some of these screws before we scratch it up too badly on those. Not that that's a big deal with this radio. So we've got the cassette mechanism. The door is entirely separate here. We've got our tuning dial. We've got, let's see, we've got this is probably, this looks like the tuner. So this is probably the radio section here. And the way most of these things are made, we then get a cassette and um, amplifier section. This chip is labeled LA4108. I'll have to look that up. We have a fairly chunky transformer. Uh, our power input, a fuse. That's good. Let's see that on there, many of these things. Um, I'm guessing this is the amplifier chip here. And we have cables going off to our speakers. Two and a half watt speakers at 2.7 ohms. So low impedance on those. And we also have two little piezo drivers there for our fizzy highs. And by the way, the piezo drivers are another thing that makes this look um, 90, uh, late, early 90s as opposed to late 90s because they kind of, in my memory, kind of disappear at some point. And we start to see in higher end stuff dynamic tweeters as opposed to the little piezo ones that are mostly not very nice sounding. So I'm going to unplug the speaker since they're plugged in right here, a nicely keyed plug, and we can get this out of our way. Okay, so now we can ha turn it right side up and have a look at what we've got. Cobwebs over here. The fate of every portable radio that ends up in the basement or the garage. We have the cassette mechanism. We have a, wow, rather worn down head on that. That you'll need to clean. We have a very dirty, I'll just point at what I'm looking at. We have a head, and if I look at it, it's, uh, when I look at it in the light, I don't think this is going to show on the camera at all, but you can see that it's worn down quite a bit. So that's, this has had a lot of use. Um, these are quite dirty, but that's easy enough to clean. So here are the Katzen's, here are, I don't know what those are, the spindles. And if I look over in here, I can see that one belt is missing, is not connected on there. That's good. If the belt just broke off and fell in somewhere, there's less likely to be belt gunk all over the place. Um, what else do we need to know about this? Not very much. Um, so it looks like we can lift the cassette mechanism and possibly the dial off. The dial doesn't have a string. It's got a piece of plastic here, which is connected to this big gum dust, but it's connected to this dust and grease. It's connected to the uh, directly to the tuning condenser right here. So, um, so the variable capacitor that is used for tuning the radio circuit. Um, let's see, we can see this is the band switch and we can see FM stereo, FM mono, AM, it's all labeled nicely. 
uh, we, you know, we don't need to remove that. Everything is modular in these kinds of things. Uh, so you see there's, there's the radio and that hooks up here. I'm going to turn this so that, and maybe zoom in so you can see that that's also labeled. It's going to be hard for me to hold this straight, but if you look at the back of the cable, it's labeled LED right channel, left channel, ground, ground and 5 volts. So that's helpful. I have a project which I've been thinking about of putting a, uh, an, an input jack into, so a jack like this essentially, into a, an existing radio that doesn't have one. Because then you could take a lot of these old radios and make them useful. You could plug it into a computer. You could plug it into a, uh, into a Bluetooth receiver, right? But um, yeah, but there you see my, my feeling is you just have to intercept the left, right, and the ground leads here, put in a switch or use a switch plug, put the plug around somewhere, probably over here, and then you could put it on radio and then override the radio by plugging it in. Now, I've been thinking about doing that with the Sanyo boombox I looked at before, but now that I found this one, I'm not sure I will, but Anyway, it's a thought, but it'd be very easy to modify this in that way. You could even do it if you wanted to find the connectors. You could do it without, uh, without actually interfering with any of the wires. I would probably cut a couple of these wires and just solder it in because I don't think I have anything that matches that like Molex connector, but maybe I do. Okay, so that's enough talk. Let's get some more. So we, we know that one of the belts is missing entirely. Uh, so let's get this get this mechanism off. And it looks like it's just four screws. I'll put these over here because they're a little different than the others. We don't have to worry about the tuning um, string because there's none. This would be easy enough. As long as you don't break it, this would be easy enough to fix. Hopefully then we'll be able to lift the whole cassette mechanism out and get access to the belts on the back. One thing you need to be careful of is that there are a number of little micro switches sort of like this. So it's not an enclosed micro switch, it's just attached to the hard plastic back plate of the tape mechanism. And uh, if you mess those up, you're going to have trouble getting the whole thing to work because that will control probably the direction on this. It'll let us know this one isn't that. This one is probably, yeah, oh, this is the, this one here is the, um, oh, okay. All right. This one over here is the um, copy protect, the right protect. Okay, so that comes off, and these are, Okay, so these are the switches that control the auto reverse function, right? And this forces the direction change. Okay, so we know what those are. I'll put them aside. Can we lift this off? Yes. All right. Okay, so we're all the way to the right on the tuner. As you see, this is off here. If we leave it alone, we might not have to recalibrate the dial. So over here we have a bunch of cables. They've given us some excess. So let's get a little excess here to work with. The same thing over here. This is probably power and something. This is very likely, yeah, this is the head out. So I'm going to, let me find it pair of pliers. I'm going to undo this one. Or maybe not. Let's, let's see if I have to. No, I don't. Okay. So now we can see the back of the mechanism. We can see that one belt has come off entirely here. 
and that's actually pretty goopy. Let me just steal a piece of paper out of the printer to put that on. So when we talk about belts that have entirely gone to liquid, this is kind of the thing. You can see how it's how it's kind of turned to goopy mess. So that will have to be cleaned up. So we can see that it's stuck around here, and then this is, yeah, so that's a bit of a mess. So that's going to have to be cleaned up. That's going to come around to here. This belt appears to be fine. So what we were having trouble with before is this. So in other words, just the very light belt that drives the auto reverse mechanism is the only one that's failed. This one is fine. So that's good because that means we don't have to take the motor off to get this belt changed here. And this one probably we'll have to probably reach through there, touches the side of this, and then around this one. So that's probably how it goes. So in size range, oh, I don't have the right size belts out, but I should have one that's close anyway. If not, I can put a smaller one on. So what I'm going to have to do is get out the alcohol and clean out. Fortunately, it's just the one um, pulley that has to be cleaned out. The rest of the mechanism looks fine. And uh, so we'll clean that out and try to figure out the routing for the belt and then button it back up and, uh, and see how that goes. So I will get out alcohol and Q-tips and, uh, and work on that. It's just, you know, it's just a question of spending time at it. It's not an inherently hard task. It's just time consuming. So I will get on that. I probably won't make you suffer through watching me do that. And then, uh, and then come back. Except that I just noticed that we now have a date for this. This says 05 September 94. It's upside down on this motor, the drive motor here. Which, uh, so that tells us that it's mid 90s. That seems about right to me. Um, I would have guessed a little bit earlier, but, but yeah. That's, that's reasonable. In terms of the construction, it's not very different from the late 80s stuff, really. But the shape of the, uh, the, shape of the housing and, uh, and the fact that auto-reverse has shown up on the mechanism are... I mean, mind you, it's Panasonic, which threw auto-reverse onto everything. But, um, but that sort of, yeah, mid-90s, that, that does seem about right. Okay, so I will pause, clean up this mess, see if I can find a belt, and then and we'll see where we are. A number of dirty Q-tips, some isopropyl alcohol, and a bit of scraping to get all this awful stuff out. And these are quite clean. I'm just going to, while I'm at it, just take a little bit and we'll just clean the inside of these a little bit. In general, you want to be careful of alcohol on anything inside an, an old boombox. Particularly, it'll fog the windows, anything, but it's usually safe enough and it'll take off the, uh, the, it'll take off the writing on the outside. So you don't really want to use it if you don't have to, but these are probably ABS plastic and there's no writing on this side, so that's probably safe enough here just to wipe things down. Yeah, the same thing applies to contact cleaner and stuff like that. You want to be a little careful, especially on the outside. It will do a number on what you're trying to repair sometimes. Okay, so this means that we can look for a belt. And this is 
these are uh, just cheapy Chinese belts, but they've mostly been okay. They are, I think, the right. Well, it's going to be too long, so it's just a question here of trying to find the right size. Well, you know, it just attaches to one of these. That's it. This pulley isn't used. That's why it was so clean. You see, the reason I know that is that well, there's no way I can show you this, but that this is slightly higher than that. You, so the, this is a smaller flywheel, and this doesn't seem to have anything in line with it as a pulley. So it's just this one. It's a little tight. Let's see if I've got one size down. If not, we'll go with this one. Let's try this one. So these are going to be the two sizes closest to this. And again, this is driving the auto reverse mechanism. So I think, oh, that's nice. Yeah, that's good. And you can see the belt's the right size. It looks about the same from the side as the other one. Let's get all these out of the way here. So now we'll just have to figure out how this goes together. I may have to look at my earlier video. Right. Now, of course, as soon as I turn it over the right way around, we can, we can see how it works, right? So it goes like that. We need to put, I need to deal with the rooting of these wires, but that's all really through here like that. All right, they went in through here. Something like that. That'll do anyway. And just make sure that the wire that goes to the head, which is of course critical, um, isn't harmed. The other thing that I'm going to do while I'm here is I'm going to get out the alcohol. Sorry, I just bashed into the. Uh, I'm going to get out the alcohol and I'm going to give the head a clean right there. Like that. I'll give the capstans a clean. They're usually not too dirty, just really dust at the bottom here. And then most importantly, the pinch rollers. And they're pretty dirty, as you can see from what's coming off of this. I think there's a couple of goes. Again, the appropriate cleaner here is isopropyl alcohol. Um, you can follow it up with demineralized water if you want to, but there's no reason to. In fact, this is 70% alcohol because that's what I've got at the moment. But in general, I would use 99 for this and keep keep the water away as much as possible. As you can see, they this has probably never been cleaned in the time it was owned. Well, we'll keep going on these. This is much easier to do with the whole thing apart, of course. They're starting to clean up. And so all you've got, what builds up on these apart from dust, is oxide that comes off the tape over the years. So, which of course it does. Usually the heads don't get too dirty. They're sort of self-cleaning, but it's the, the transport that really gets dirty. So I think we can probably fairly say that the most of the mechanism here is going to work. The issue is going to be whether the auto reverse mechanism works. And there is, I mean, I'm not entirely sure I got that belt correct, correctly situated, but I'm pretty sure I did. Okay, so let's dry them off with really it could do another round do with another round of cleaning, but there's just there's enough dust around here as well that it's getting built up on the 
on the little um, swab here. Okay. But you'll notice that when you have a look at the cassette mechanism, you know, are all the little bits and pieces still in place? Can you see all the springs? Has nothing popped out? That's always worth having a look at because if you, if they aren't, right, it's not going to work for you. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is I will put this back in place here and I've deliberately not touched anything. And, oops, underneath that we need to put this. No, oh, I'm sorry. That's the wrong way around. This goes on top. Like that. I mean, Panasonic's made it very clear how it works, which is nice. Uh, so I'm going to put in the screws on here, I think. And one more wire, I mean, well, sorry, one more screw here. Right, let's see how we're doing for the dial. That looks pretty good. Let's give this a little bit of a wipe off since it's dusty. I may have skipped a tooth or two on this dial, so if need be, we can fix that later. But uh, very simple mechanism. You can see the, the plastic piece coming around and it's geared teeth. Very simple, very clever. All right, so the next step is going to be to plug in some power, keeping in mind that given that this is a little later, we have exposed electrical connections here. Fuse, 2.5 amps, 125 volts. Um, not sure what that's for. Looks like two diodes and two capacitors. I'm not sure. I think the rectifier is going to be over here. Um, older equipment tends to have enclosed transformers and, uh, and no power that you could touch on the inside, which makes it a little safer to work on, of course. And we've had enough time that I'm sure all the, all the uh, alcohol has dried. So let me go find the power cord, plug this in, and we'll, we'll see if it works. So just as I'm starting to get this plugged in, I just want to point out that often at this point we would be talking about um, trying to adjust the position of the head, right? But on the Panasonic's and all these auto reverse ones, you can see that it's been, the mechanism flips around. It's got two sort of azimuth adjustments for the head here. And you'll see that they've got them all glued in place. And I'm very reluctant to touch them on these kinds of mechanisms, the Iowa ones or anything that's similar. These are very, very touchy. So yeah, usually, it would be kind of very much a last resort to touch those. Anyway, we've got the power cable and I'm going to, I guess I'll plug in the speakers. Well, let's try it without the speakers first and then, then we can add them. So again, keeping in mind that that's going to be live over there as soon as this is in. So there, it's plugged in. Keep fingers away from that. And we'll put in a tape. As is traditional around here, we'll do use rush. Okay, let's make sure it's on the tape position and we'll hit play. All right, so we can see that everything's turning, the pinch roller's turning, so we know that's fine. Let's, there we go. There's the auto reverse mechanism is working. Stops after. Right? It's neat how the head turns around, isn't it? And if you switch that switch, it should 
I think it'll stop on the next one. Yeah. Oh, no, maybe this overrides the switch position. Uh, which is eject. Okay, so we've got a tape deck that appears to be working properly. Let's unplug the power again, and we'll get the speakers hooked up and try it again. So here are the speakers. Turn around the correct way. And let's see, that goes that way. All right, I'll turn down the volume. Plug the power back in and we'll try the tape again. And we'll only play it very briefly because Rush will copyright strike. Okay, so there we have it. Speaker's now plugged in. We'll put Fly By Night in again and hit play. Okay, so we have it together. And the first thing to check is going to be that the um, radio is still kind of in alignment. So let's set it to AM. So what I'd like to find is I'd like to find this is probably our sports station here, which is five. Which is 590. That doesn't look terribly off. Let's put it to FM. So I do actually think that I've got the uh, that I've that I've moved the pointer on this. So I'm going to open it up and see if I can slide it in this direction by a notch. Okay, so I'm going to do that by loosening this screw here. Well, you know what? I'm going to have to loosen both of these, unfortunately. Remove this mechanism, lift this up, and push the pointer to the right a little bit. We'll put this back in place. I'll just do one of the screws up, and then I will try it again until I think I'll just use 590 until that is more or less. So that's 590 right there. So let's see if we can find 88.1. Although most FM. So that's 88.1. Yeah, so we need to slide it over a bit farther. Well, now I feel like I might have overdone it a bit. Let's try AM. Yeah, so we're a bit off the other way. There we go. Okay, I'll try again. Radio. So that's 88.1. That looks about spot on to me. We'll go to AM. So, as we can see, FM and AM don't line up perfectly. So that's still, that's 590, which is looking more like 600. But I think that's as good as it's going to be. Okay, so let's try the cassette player again. Again, just very briefly here because um, 
will be hit with a copyright strike on this. So. so let's fast forward a bit. Not much high end on that. Oops, I went the wrong way. I forgot it was an auto reverse deck. I should say this this cassette lived in the car for a long time. There's not much high end left on it anyway. What I really want to do. Okay. So what we really want to do here is fast forward enough that we can hear what the other side sounds like and whether both sides of the um, of the head are in decent alignment. That might do it. Yeah, so not much high end that maybe the worn out tape head, it might be an alignment issue, but I don't really think so. Um, we'll try another tape. You couldn't hear that, but the, the um, tape mechanism was still on one of the switches in there. Is a little sticky, but it does work. So as always with a mechanical thing, it wouldn't be a bad idea to run a couple of tapes through. Oh, the equalizer was set wrong. Okay, let's set the equalizer to flat. Let's try again just to see what the sound is like. And with extra bass on. Yeah, that's a little better. So this is, I think, fixed. I think it works fine. I think once a few cassettes are run through and one that's not quite as worn out as this one is run through, it'll sound okay. Um, this was probably never a fantastic sounding tape deck, although it's reasonably well made one and the Panasonic's I had in that era were, were pretty good. Uh, there are a few things more you could do to this. Obviously it needs more cleaning. It needs to be cleaned around these switches and whatnot. I don't really notice any noise in the volume control and whatnot, but it probably wouldn't do any harm to spray some cleaner in them, but I'm not going to right now because the cleaner I have is not lubricated and it will take the lubricant out of this. So if it doesn't need it, I'm not going to put it in. Um, band switch works, um, selector works, tape deck is working fine. So essentially we have a, barring the battery door, we have a completely working and largely complete uh, Panasonic from 1994. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. I should say, I never, I, I understand why people throw out boom boxes from this era because they often don't have a line in. Um, and the, once the CD player stops working or the tape deck stops working in that, then they get tossed. But this one has a line in, which means that this is still a useful device. So I would recommend that anyone who finds, you know, a boom box from the late 80s, or but especially the early 90s when they start to get line in jacks like this, that, you know, they're worth picking up. This sounds surprisingly good. It's got, you know, extra bass. It's got the silly equalizer, no remote control. Another reason why they started to get get tossed but you know this was someone's shop radio throw a bluetooth on it it could be your shop radio again all right hope you enjoyed that have a good afternoon